fans <laughs> in game number two. So I said you would you would think they would change, <laughs> but they yeah. didn't. And immediately going for identical picks once again. The Gragas insta lock from AM. Proof hovering the Rek'Sai and the Nautilus. <laughs> uh, did, did we go through like a time loop or something? This is the exact same thing. Yeah, they're, they're like remake, remake. Yeah, remake? yeah, we'll do it remake. again. Remake, you guys. Twenty minute, no rush. Man, if we're seeing the exact same game over again, I'm not gonna complain. Yeah, that, that was, was fun. Uh, oh man, it was great. It was great. You know, AM, I wonder if they feel that they can play out the exact same comp. It worked really effectively, and it was really only until Bob Chin started going off. But he still gets the counter pick, right? Yes. He still gets the Katarina. They didn't ban it. They didn't drop it away for the Zed. They're going to change it up a tiny bit. Go with the Graves instead of the Lucian here. So Lucian and his impact in the later game wasn't as powerful in team fights. They want to have more layered ultimates. Graves on top of an Orianna if they pick it again. Absolute huge amount of burst damage there. Also, they pick up the Diana before they see what the top lane is, but that could be a mid lane Diana. That could be Epic Shots playing the Assassin that he's wanted to play for a while now, shying away from the Orion. If he gets a squishy matchup in the mid lane, they might swap it. Yeah, so far it seems as though UBC are playing the exact same game, leaving Bob Chin up for last pick. Trying to find out if Epic Shots is going to end up on that mid or, uh, Oriana or Diana or switch it up for something new. Yeah, UBC was not happy with their performance in that last game, but they definitely don't chalk it up to picks and bans. They're going to go once again with the low wave clear composition here. If they draft a mid laner with substantial wave clear, it'll definitely cover that weakness. But so far, they were exploited earlier on that. But here's the thing. It's wave clear is not like, oh, it's the, it's the end all be all of team comps. You can play around it for sure. You start team fights. They have the ability to do so. They played to that strength. The only thing is you do give up sieging power. But it's just like how a sieging team is like, oh, we don't want to take team fights, right? So it's just one of the strengths and weaknesses of the comp. And it is going to be pretty much the same here, except that's going to be a jungle Gragas for Picarus now. He's going to have more pressure in these lanes as opposed to the Nunu where he's running around, yeah. had a little bit of pressure, but keeping up with the lane phase of UBC was definitely something that Picarus is now going to try to give himself an edge on. Yeah, a lot more CC on this team. So if it is a Katarina locked in once again, should be a bit better for AM to deal with. All right. And Bobchin locks in the Cassidy. I like that. Yeah, so I was actually talking with the backstage and their coach, Heaven Time. He was like, I don't know why you picked Katarina. I told him not to pick Katarina. <laughs> I thought Cassidy would be the better champion here. And I guess he's listening to his coach this time. He had his fun, he had his pentakills, mm -hmm. almost two of them. But <laughs> now he's on the Cassidy, he's on another mobile champion, another champion that doesn't have to weave too much in and out of fights, just keeps going with the fight. So he's a little bit more durable than the Katarina. He'll be able to get into that backline and stay in that backline and continue to push forward with his team. So they do suffer from almost the same problem, but they're still going to play around their wave clear. They're still going to be okay with that. And Texas A&M, they get a little more dive. They get a little more team fight themselves with the Alistar combined with the Gragas. It, it seems as though Epic Lynx is kind of in an awkward situation now. Last game, he had a squishy Katarina that he could target and destroy in team fights. But this time around, he's got to hunt down a Cassidy who has as many jumps, if not more, than Diana. But we are loading into the game. We're about to get into game number two between Texas's A&M University and the University of British Columbia. So far, UBC are up one to zero. One more win would put them in the grand finals of the 2015 NACC. And the shot at that huge amount of prize money, huge oh, yeah. amount of scholarships there for themselves, and a lot of validation for the League of Legends habit in, or lifestyle in college. Mm. That's a big thing here for both these teams. You heard UBC talking about how it's an identity for them, that they are the League of Legends guys at their school, and this is a big amount of validation for them. If they make the finals, you know everybody at the school is going to be watching them. Yeah. This is very exciting. So Texas, we, now, we now load onto the Rift. Yeah, and Texas A&M, pretty much the same thing there, too. Big sports school. Mm -hmm. Get esports in the mix. They do have that legacy. A lot of support there mm -hmm. for competition and they want to be able to set that up. They said a lot of them are seniors. Oh, oh! BM going down in the mid lane. <laughs> I'm not sure who fired the first shot, but the taunts are coming out. You know Bob Chin is actually the designated trash talker for UBC? If he gets the ability to trash talk even more this game, it's going to make him a happy, happy void being. 
bit of a deep work coming out. Looks like AM are content to sit with that defensive line. UBC not going to opt into any sort of silly lane swaps. I say silly, they're actually rather clever. <laughs> they're very fun. But UBC are content in their mechanical skill. I mean, heck, they picked up first blood three minutes in. Yeah, and they were up 3-1. It was just the team fights that they were struggling in a bit until Bob Chin showed up and just crushed off of some mistakes from Texas A&M. Uh, Texas A&M, what I was just talking about a second ago, though, is the support. A lot of them are seniors, right? They're going to graduate, but winning this is going to give them a lot of validation for their club, a lot of validation for their, the legacy that it would leave as well. And more people would be attracted to the club and would basically take up the banner when they're gone. That's what these guys are here for. You heard that they were too much in it for the money at first, and now it's about that legacy for them. Yeah. Legacy is very important. Coming into game number two, Minion spawn. Both of the bot lanes start off in lane. They don't want to get caught out by that quick level two once again. You see Chuck Normus is shoving that wave as hard as possible. Try to keep it balanced out. Remy going for the auto attack grass again. Oh, they turn around. Ooh, Chuck Normus, man. Already taking big harass. Some great wave clear. And forgive me, he's actually hanging on. No, there he goes. Finally drops the Targon charge. Proof starting on the red side. Gragas starting on his blue. Everyone's on the same side of the jungle. Similar, similar setup to game number one. Except for the part where they didn't do a Grom bottom. Yes. And the level two actually comes out for Texas A&M a little earlier. Remy's going to look for the hook. Oh, good dodge. <laughs> Get out of here. Smacks him on the way out. Says, I don't want any of this. Proof. He, he actually is on route to go for a gank on the bottom side of the map. Clearing yeah. this blue buff puts him down there. And it's good to see UBC come out with more diverse strategies because he used to just be camp top, camp middle, and it was very predictable. And now if they're able to play to this bottom lane, which has the same two champions again, the Nautilus and the Ergot, they play to this bottom lane. It's very unexpected. But of course, they saw it last game, so it could be a little bit unexpected. Yeah. Could get something changing up a little bit. Proof clearing out the Scuttle Crab. Oh, he's confident on this Rex oh, side. Oh, yeah, he's going around, gets a deep ward. He is going to find an overextended Epic Shots who's shoving forward. Bob Jin shows that the gank is coming. Is he going to find the knockup? Epic Shots caught in the slow. Oh, he burns his flash, gets out just fine. Takes a lot of damage, too. Oh, That's yeah. going to be a potion toll on him in that lane. The sooner you get those potions, the sooner you get him out of lane. And giving any type of help to a Cassidy helps him through that early game, helps him get to that mid-late game where Bob Chin is going to be an absolute beast on that champion. Winning phase continues. Uh-oh. Flank coming in from behind. Proof of payments. Looking for it. He comes over the wall. Epic Whoa. Shots has no flash. He gets the flash. Knockup. Epic Shots could give up first blood. He does. Proof of payment secures it. They are just trying to keep down Epic Shots. He had such an amazing performance on this Orianna last game. Camp him so much this game, they blew two flashes for that too, knowing his was down. Really, really big commitment to taking him out early. Yeah, but that is going to be Bob Chin getting an assist right away. He's up in CS, and Epic Shots is forced to start with a double Doran's rig. That's going to slow down his build a lot. Ooh, yeah. The fact that he's not on path for that Athene's early on is going to deter it a tiny bit. He also gets boots for himself as well. So definitely going about a bit out of the way to just survive the lane. Yeah, this is starting to look like UBC are playing a style that they have typically played throughout the rest of the NACC during group stages and qualifiers. If it worked for them then, why not get it working now? However, playing that style, that is something that Tamu is familiar with, has been doing research on and preparing for. And UBC are just trying to play their style. Like I said, they haven't researched too much. But if they're able to dictate the pace of the game, then it's definitely in their favor. And camping for Bob Jin, Kastner has a little more gank assistance than Ekaterina. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, they're both just as snowball-y. The big concern for Texas A&M is making it out of the laning phase without being at too much of a deficit. So far, it seems like things are pretty much even. 
outside of that Bob Chin assist. And take a look at the wards from Picarus. He's getting deep wards all around that mid. He's got a pink on the bottom side river. Epic shots with no flash feels so safe because he's because he knows he's got Picarus. Now Epic Lynx could be caught out here. DJJ does have level he's got six. Level six too. Turns it around. Epic Lynx is gonna have to. Oh no. Oh no. <laughs> oh no. So Proof is playing to his solo lanes, but he's yeah. taking both kills too. <laughs> so this is a very familiar UBC style though. Camp top, camp mid, make sure those lanes are on good footing. And Picarus is definitely going to have his work cut out for him. You see him going for those deep wards because they value that vision control early to get through this phase of the game. But when your lanes are getting punished, are getting kind of wrapped around there from their own laner, there's not much you can do about that as a jungler. Yeah. Proof actually goes for the invade here. He's got a ward to spot Picarus coming in from the top side. Epic Lynx did not flash for that gank. He saw that he was aggressive. He saw that he was out of position. But he kept his cool. And that is a very good sign for a &M. They still have themselves together. They're not falling apart. They may be down, there, down a game. Their first game out of nine. But they're still feeling safe. They're still feeling confident. Chuck Normus feeling confident enough to auto-attack yeah. Remy here. Yeah, he knows that the laner isn't there. He waves back for his first purchase of the game. Tier, Longsword, uh, Pickaxe. But uh, Chuck Normus hasn't gone for his first purchase just yet, so he's trying to shove the wave oh. out. A little bit of zoning there. Almost catches Bob Chin. He doesn't have flash, but he doesn't need it when he's casted it. Gets away just fine. Pink Ward is cleared out. Once again, a and playing the objective game as they get some damage across on the mid turret. Epic Lynx goes in, forces Bob Chin to jump away. Once again, lack of wave clear on UBC. This time AM are trying to capitalize on it much sooner. They are getting their split push on though. DJJ, yeah. when you get solo time with a turret, Regardless of what champion, it's definitely beneficial for you. And when you're in a team that lacks wave clear, if you can get those T1s down very very quickly, very early on, oh. then you're able to snowball harder. And it's much easier to siege. I know it's very obvious thing to say. It's much easier to siege even without wave clear when you're heading bold. So when you get those turrets down early, it just helps you get the next tier. Oh man, UBC making a very strong play here as they start the dragon. They know that Epic Lynx doesn't have his teleport because he burned it getting back. After that death, is Picker's gonna look for it? Yeah, he does have it. Bob Chin actually jumps in on the far side. Epic shots tries oh, to punish him. There's the teleport Hello. onto the back side. The fight breaks out, forgive me. Gets onto Remy and he waves in the back, but Chuck Normus is still doing just fine. No, nope, he's turned upon. He goes low to 200. Shield doesn't make it in time. Proof on a killing spree. Picarus is continuing to chase, but this is 3v5 here. They're Epic kiting no now. Bob Chin gets another kill. He waves, might be the only one to die, but this could be four kills for UBC. They didn't have Epic Links, and they didn't have mana on Picarus or Epic Shots. The shield came out, fizzled on Chuck Normus. He was killed before it landed, and it still took the mana, and he had nothing left at that point. No mana for the for the follow-up, no mana even just reposition the ball. Oh, Epic, Epic Links, Links, he will get a turret for their trouble, yeah. though. He clears that off. Bob Chin shows himself in the mid lane. He's got full health and full mana. Turns it around, looking for a kill to add to his 1-0-2 record. Depth Charge comes out. Epic Links does have Flash. Might be able to make it out of this. 250, he does. Ooh. They don't want to dive to Tier 1. But UBC are so strong right now. They've got a lot of kills. UBC have a much bigger kill disparity and the first dragon. It's looking like a cleaner game one, for, cleaner version of game one for them. Yeah. They got some kills early, it was very hectic. It was all in that bottom lane. Now, proof of payments, 3-0-3 mm -hmm. with 100% kill participation in this game. I was talking to him backstage, he was not happy with his performance. He's saying that he's cringing at himself. <laughs> and now he's going for crazy things like diving a tier one turret at level three just to get the flank off of a blown flash. This is an aggressive player that we're seeing here. There's a reason that Rek'Sai and Nidalee are banned against him all the time. Yeah, here's the breakdown. Yeah, you can see Picarus jumped in thinking it was going to be a fight they could take. Epic Shots blew his shockwave to keep DJ, DJJ out of the fight a little longer. But instead, he finds himself out of mana. DJJ just goes back up and then comes down using the ultimate. And it's a long, drawn-out fight with very oh, low resources on multiple members, key members of Texas A&M.
Yeah, that was just a slaughter very early on. UBC feeling very confident in this. Picarus, however, still going to look for a gank. Oh, Proof is here. waiting for the counter, trying to zone DJJ out. But as soon as Picarus leaves because he thinks he's going to get a gank, it could be problem. It could be a big problem. Yeah, DJJ clears the wave out a little bit. Picarus continuing to main that forward pressure. Pink's now going down onto the MiG. Shockwave is blown by Epic Shots. Bobchin flanked on three sides. He's going to jump the wall. No, he turns around and goes the other direction. He's got his flash. There is his next void walk. He's now running to the safety of the bottom lane. Makes it out in time. Ping's going down in the mid lane. a and say, we don't need kills. We'll go for turrets instead. They will trade their top tier one. Yep, they have the much, much inner route. They have the inner route to this turret. We see people coming around the side here from UBC. We do see ultimates on DJJ, but this is all five members oh boy. of Texas A&M. The only person defending is Bob Chin. He can't get to the minion wave in the back line without jumping on the enemy team. Next minion wave. Oh, just a few seconds too late. AM decide they don't like this position. They're being collapsed upon. DJJ looking for the fight. Misses the ultimate death charge onto Epic Shots. He's double knocked up. He's going to go down. Bob Chin picks it up. UBC are doing some great damage. Epic Link's running away. Chuck Normus is collapsed upon. The target picking is great. They pick up one now, another one. It's three members dead. Picarus is the next person to be collapsed upon. Nobody even cares about Epic Links anymore. It's another four kills for UBC. They're 10 to one, 12 and a half minutes into the game. UBC definitely turning around from game one, having great team fights, and DJJ coming in from the side, splitting them, and then Remy with the follow up oh, there. No. Everybody just collapsing onto the fight immediately. They seem much more on the same page. This game, very controlled. Laning phase just crippled underneath UBC. They're into the team fight, and they're already 5,000 gold in the lead. Yeah, Texas A&M, uh, uh, UBC, they already feel as though they've accomplished the most difficult thing in the NACC by beating the West Division. They feel as though they're already on top of the pack. Historically, yeah. the strongest region. Yeah, if you look at last year's NACC, all top four teams were Western. Washington, SJSU, Irvine, UBC. They conquered the West already, and you can see right here, it's off of all of this team fighting. Heat Waves gets the swap on Epic Links, and then Epic Links is just forced to flash and walk out of the fight. Then Heat Waves is able to turn back. And Bob Chin, the way he's able to get onto Epic Shots just at the start and get that mid laner off of the fight is big. Bob Chin's playing a champion that allows him to actually be part of the initiation instead of the Katarina who had to skitter around, wait for cooldowns, then come back into the fight. He gets to be a part of that front line. He gets to do a lot of the burst and, and the upfront damage. So this Cassidy is falling into the lineup a lot smoother. And a big part of how UBC is this far ahead in the game is proof of payment. 406, 100% kill participation on this Rek'Sai. He has been effective in all three lanes and influencing the jungle and objectives. He is on his game right now. And like I said before, giving him Rek'Sai, giving him Nidalee. Teams have made the mistake before, but it's one right now that they're definitely paying for on Texas A&M. Oh yeah. We can see this in how Epic Lynx is building as well. Going full defensive. He's got his double Doran's ring, built up a Seekers and a Null Magic Mantle. He's not going to be too effective for a very long time. And that's a scary position when your top lane assassin is forced to build completely defensively. UBC have got complete control over this game. To be fair, AM have got excellent vision control over the Dragon Pit. They control the river. They know where UBC are at all times, so they can play around it and try to continue laning. At this point in the game, though, when you're continuing to lane and you don't have any damage from your top lane or Epic Links on this Assassin, this is the worst feeling when you're playing a Diana top and you have this build where you have almost no extra AP. You're sitting on basically both types of resistances and you're wishing you were like a Maokai or something like that. You're like, oh, I'm tanky anyway. But now he's trying to actually put damage into the fight. His job is an Assassin and he's going to have to wait for power spikes. He's going to have to wait for points where he's actually relevant. Because right now, he's basically an interrupt of Moonfall. Yeah, that's how Epic Lynx is trying to play it out. Dragon spawns. Red buff is going to be secured by Chuck Normus. Proof looking to put the aggression on. 
just try to keep AM uncomfortable, try to prevent them from setting up in a good position so that you can capitalize a little bit later on. This would be Dragon 2 for UBC, but they aren't going to start it just yet. Teleport available for both DJJ and Epic Links. There's the Dragon. DJJ with the wave pushed up, doesn't even have to burn his teleport to walk on down. Dragon. So you can see right there, just the ward control yeah. from UBC. And the fact that they haven't let Texas A&M get the ward control past the river means they can't see a lot of these moves coming ahead of time. Bobchin gets the stick on the side, and they don't know if he's gone yet. Chuck Normus can't push up. Yeah, Chuck Normus, he was up in CS this game on his graves against Urgot, but now he's down just a bit. He's definitely down in total gold with the enormous amount of kills uh, and assists picked up by UBC. Cast in Bob Chin, continuing to be a nuisance in the bottom lane. Epic Link's even forced to be pulled down and hold that bottom wave. He does now have a Negatron cloak to help keep him alive against that very scary Cassidin, and they send Chuck Normus to the top wave to continue getting him farmed. You can see Proof going for the Aegis of the Legion against the double AP composition here very early on. So the damage that Epic Lynx is putting out is even lower at this point. Just that ward line all across. Yeah. UBC have the ability to continue to push up their ward control and their vision. But right now, they're just trying to control the river, establish their dominance of that area, and that's how they're going to get these turrets. They still have that tier 1 turret that they need to knock down. Yeah, UBC taking it nice and slow. They know they have an enormous advantage in this game, up to 6,500 gold. They've got a Cassidid with a Rod of Ages that's been stacking up for a few minutes. They've got full tank Rek'Sai, full tank Scion. Very scary team that they're building up together. And they're just denying vision at this point. Bob Chin is going to continue to split push against Epic Lynx. And then DJJ, he gets to push bottom. So overcoming the wave clear deficit by splitting up and split pushing is a good strategy here. Because if you pull people to go after the very slippery Cassid in top, the level 11, so he has the rank 2 ultimate, as soon as you go for him, he's going to rift walk away. You get damage on mid turret, you get damage on bottom turret, but they have to reach those turrets first and make sure that they could actually duel their respective lane opponents. Yeah. I do really like what UBC are doing. They're taking their time. They know that they have this huge advantage, so they're being patient with it. They yeah. don't want to take any chances. Right now, they're pretty much testing the armor, looking for the cracks in it. They've got a hammer, and they're trying to find where it breaks. They're, they're chipping away at the marble statue, trying to find the soft, soft veins of Texas A&M's rock. They can't quite yet. They're holding up. They're doing exactly what they need to do with stalling. But both dragons are in favor of UBC at the moment. They have the superior wave clear on Texas A&M. UBC are not grouping up for a five-man team fight to force anything. Instead, they're trying to split push now. This strategy, getting them some turret damage very occasionally. But they're playing the patient game. Baron is up at 25 seconds. They aren't taking it very slow. Baron is spawning and there is absolutely no vision on the pit. Mm -hmm. Proof is going to be clearing out Scuttle Crab to try to secure some of that. Recall from Bob Chin as he looks for another. It could be a bait spike. tool here because they don't have a blue trinket yet on Texas A&M. Shark Normus hasn't picked it up. Don't know if he's going to, but the fact that they've secured Scuttler for themselves, that they have the split push in bottom lane and in top, and the vision control of that entire area, even if they wanted just to start a five on five without turrets around in a sieging situation, they can just go to Baron and bait it out. It's 20 minute Baron, it's risky, but just not even doing it, but baiting it is important. Epic Lynx has completed an Abyssal Scepter, so he is somewhat relevant. Find some damage on the Bob Chin, who doesn't want to trade any harass back. Yeah, as soon as he hit that Abyssal Scepter, he's in good shape mm -hmm. to trade with Bob Chin multiple times and try to poke him out of the lane, try to whittle him down a bit. 
Look at the vision on the map for these oh, teams. Yeah. It, it just became very explosive for Texas yeah. A&M. As soon as the backs came out from UBC, they got to move up and put their ward control around the Baron and scatter some around the Dragon as well. But their priority was make sure that Baron is at least covered. At least these entrances are covered too. Because Epic Lynx has been having to farm at turret for a very long time and not put any pressure on the map. So dedicating wards to him top allows him to shove out a little more, allows him to get a little more pressure out of that Diana. Yeah, once again, we after a brief four-man group. Speaking of pressure on Diana, hey! Oh, DJJ finds Epic Lynx. Getting a little bit of harass down, but Epic Lynx has hit some of those breakpoints that keep him alive, keep him sustained. However, Epic Lynx will not be able to harass DJJ. He has got so much health, armor, and magic resist. Scion has reached his tank status. Minor bummer for Epic Lynx, but at least he can keep farming. So we're noticing a pattern here. When UBC gets a really big lead in the game, closing it out is a little rough with the comps that they select. But that's not a bad thing, because it means they start playing it safe. They start choking their opponent out, making sure that they're changing that gold lead to be like, all right, it's around 7K. Let's not make it get any worse. Let's keep. Let's pick up two more dragons just off of this lead yeah. over time. Let's get wave control, soak the waves, make sure we aren't missing anything, and don't get too hyped up and force anything that you end up getting punished for. Because even though it is a 7.5K gold lead, diving a turret is going to be absolutely terrible against an Alistar that'll peel, an Orianna that'll peel your backline, a Gragas that'll separate you. So diving this team is extremely difficult. Yeah. And UBC are just trying, like I said, looking for the crack in the armor. To be fair, A&M are holding exceptionally yes. well. They were they were down 7,000. They've only lost another 1,000. Epic Lynx actually forced a flash here. He's going to end up going down as they get the knockup. Come on, guys. I was just commending you for doing well. <laughs> Another kill for UBC. They turn on the heat what? waves. A lot of damage comes across. Teleport. They could try to turn this. Immediately AM back out. The shockwave finds heat waves. He flashes. Oh. Collateral damage turns it. But here comes Proof diving the turret fully tank. He can absorb that for quite a while. Bob Jin on a rampage. They've got the damage. Chuck Normus doesn't have the health. He goes down. It's a triple kill for Bob Jin with the double AoE. And the mid laner of UBC is at it again. 6 0 and 3 right now. 23 minutes into the game. Dragon's live. They're going to get a turret for themselves. They'll look at the second one, see if they can take it down. And Bob Jin, he's looking to get some extra kills on himself. Go oh, ahead, no, Shot. He turns on the epic shots, getting some damage across. He's got red buff. Dodges the command attack not once, but twice. Zoning him away, that's the tier two going down. And Dragon, no, they actually don't take the tier two. Yep. Respawn timers are still very short. Yeah, it's only 23 minutes in the game. Yeah. So there's still a lot of options here for Texas A&M. It's 10K gold lead, team fighting, you saw it there. It's extremely rough for them. They'd have to stall a very long time. But UBC are playing this very calculated, very controlled. They didn't take a fight until they caught out Epic Lynx, and then this was able to start. Forgive me goes in. DJJ has his back. TPs to a minion. The shockwave only hits one, and that's the go button there. That's proof. Come over the wall. DJJ ultimate three-man knockup here for the extra delay. Nobody can help Picarus. And then the ultimate on the Chuck Norm is trying to get to that back line. And Bob Chin, full mana. They're starting this fight with great resources. And they and you can see Epic Shots there again, almost out of mana at the start of the fight throwing the shockwave out, throwing the command attacks over and over again. We're constantly seeing him getting picked off with almost nothing in that pool. Yeah, Proof is so aggressive right now. He finds Picarus, actually forces the oh explosive boy. cast. He's still going. Picarus has no flash. Ooh, good protect. Keeps Picarus alive. The bullying there yeah. from UBC in the jungle. Proof of payment still sitting at 100% kill participation. His multiple knockups. He's showing up to these fights at the right time. And now, oh, oh the shockwave goes wide. Instantly, heat waves turns. Get some harass across. A lot of flashes were burned in the last team fight. Epic shots landing three man shockwaves back to back. Game one. Game two. When your back is against the wall, when you're 10K down, the pressure is huge. And that is a pick where you're looking for just can we get something? Can we get anything to get us back into this game? He's oh. going for it, but Heat Wave's just a little too far out of it. Yeah, Bob Chin getting a free tier two there as Epic Lynx was caught recalling. Still sitting on that Abyssal Seeker. In the past five minutes, all he's done is add a home guard to his build. 
he is slowly but surely being choked out by UBC as they roll closer and closer to the grand finals of the NACC. They're up 13 kills now. Two turrets, three dragons, and 11,000 gold. UBC are looking to still close this game out, cracking the inhibitor turrets is a tall order for this team. 26 minutes in, like you said, 11K gold up. It's looking grim for Texas A&M, especially after that stellar game one, who was back and forth. They made it out of the lane phase. They were able to bring it back. Right now though, Baron is on the field. Lots of wards around it, lots of positioning. Epic Lynx is going a little too far forward up top. But they're skittering around it, and DJJ is oh, pulling attention. No, if he they doesn't catch have him, flash. Epic Lynx gets caught out once again. Tries to jump into the back. That's a lot of ultimates being blown, but he finally goes down. Rami picks it up. They turn. They find Epic shots now. Oh, a great shockwave finds two members. They turn it into a fight. If they can pick off the damage dealers, this is so big for a &M, but no. DJJ comes in from the back. Chuck Normus, the only DPS living for his team. Picarus trying to zone it off. There's the suppression. Picarus goes down to DJJ. Chuck Normus goes down to heat waves. Oh, man, this is UBC picking up another kill. An ace for Bob Chin. Not a single member has died. UBC. Snowballing forward. Looking straight at the Baron, too, immediately after that. Clean ace for them. 27 minutes into the game. Able to take that fight after Epic Lynx. He keeps getting caught out. Diana, immobile. You're immediately punished for your mistakes against this team comp that can just point and click you with Nautilus or with the suppression. A lot of ways to gap close on a Diana. Yeah, they are going to take this Baron here. 27 and a half minutes in, UBC are up 18 kills and Baron. They have everything going for them. Absolutely they, everything. They want this. And I talked to them about what's it mean to possibly win this tournament as a Western team. Does, do they want to keep the West on top? Because West has been a dominant region for a very, very long time. And they said no, they don't really care about keeping the West on top. They care about getting first for UBC. Yeah. It's all about that school pride here, and you can see them coming together as a team. As soon as Epic Lynx is out of position, Epic Shots is then out of position, and he can't go through Remy or else he's going to get rooted, so he chooses to go bottom, and DJJ is there, and he gets rooted anyway. A hectic team fight, but after losing Epic Lynx before both team fights that have happened previously, He's in a really bad spot right now. Yeah, this is UBC feeling so strong. They are playing like kings right now. And take a look at the KDA of Proof. It looks suspiciously similar to the number of kills on the top of the board. This guy has been coming up huge this game. Yeah, facilitated the early game. Now it's all about those catches on Epic. Like, Epic shots. Once again, he's out of mana. Oh, tricky situation. Death Charge comes out. He's forced to flash. Proof continuing to dive forward. There's so much CC to lock him down, but he is still going. UBC aggressing forward. Now Bob Chin has joined the battle. Heat Waves picks up Forgive Me. And UBC are now up another kill. Setting up a split push should mean that an inhibitor will go down with that Baron buff. UBC are just trying to go crazy now in the yeah. game. Epic, epic shots there. You, you would think, why would you go after a no mana target? Because he's not going to contribute any damage to it. They're looking for the pick on him so that they stunt the wave clear for a little bit so they can get in on these turrets. Yeah, now Dragon has respawned. UBC do not feel the immediacy to clear it right away. Instead, they're going to get every single wave pushing. There's Proof going to clear that out. Bob Chin continuing to zone the rest of AM away. While the pressure continues, DJJ single-handedly dealing with this top lane, keeping Epic Lynx occupied. Double teleport is available. A little bit of damage coming across, but Epic Lynx is able to clear the wave in time. They could look to catch DJJ here. He's trying to get in front to body block the ultimate, but he's going to be turned around upon. Oh, great shockwave cancels the knockup. DJJ. He's so tanky. Yeah, he's extremely tanky. Being 3-0 and 11, 30 minutes in, level 16, he's doing a good job for himself. I do have to commend Epic Lynx, though. Yeah. He's been farming like a monster this game, staying up, or at least even, with DJJ, despite him having a much better scoreline. 
and having a very kind of poor build on Diana because you're forced to go that way. Yeah, Baron buff just wears off as UBC get back under the turret. They are going to continue sieging as they have got some very, very large advantages. They did take that Dragon 4, so they should have a better time sieging those turrets and knocking them down. Bit of BM coming out from Remy. He's feeling happy. I think he can afford it. <laughs> you see DJJ bottom clearing up a huge mini wave for himself. And now the siege situation, still, it's hard to crack. But when Heat Waves lands those Noxian Corrosive Charges, he's able to follow up with a lot of Acid Hunters and get the poke off. Chuck Normus has to back off, but they don't have a mini wave to continue pushing. Bob Chin goes in for some harass. Getting a little aggressive. He doesn't have his flash just yet. His only way out is to use that Void Walk. Yeah. So it's, indeed the, the Rift Walk has an extremely low cooldown. He's level 16. Yeah. He has the Athenes and the Ionian Boots of Lucidity. So we're looking at something around a 1.5, 1.4 second cooldown. Oh, the dive but begins. About DJJ that. looking to end the game as UBC goes straight past the turret. Epic Links turns on to Heat Waves, but Bob Chin is on. Epic Shot's in the back. Epic Shot's goes low. He drops. Bob Chin is legendary. Now he's kiting it around even more, trying to get more damage. Shut down! It's going to be Epic Links who picks that kill up. The turret is doing some serious work here. If they can stall him out under the turret, AM could look to get a few revenge kills. A double kill on Epic Links now. Could he be the carry that AM need? DJJ, his 500 health, 5,000 health, down to now only 1,000. A triple kill on Epic Links. AM capitalizing on UBC's greed. You dive uh, an inhibitor turret and you expect to just run over them? It's not that easy, especially <laughs> with a lead that's 16k. They had almost, they had more than that to start the fight. But they're getting frustrated with trying to crack these turrets down. They're trying to look for the team fight. They're trying to look to get epic, epic shots off the map immediately. And it's not happening. They chase him all the way to their Nexus turrets. And you can see Chuck Norris. They wanted him originally, they changed to Epic Shots. Nice interrupts there onto DJJ to make sure he can't get his skill shots off. And they pick him up, but Bob Chin is taking so much damage here. Picker is trying to get to them, and Epic Links was in the back the entire time. Heat Waves was also slowed and took half his HP from the inhibitor turret, because when they were walking by, he was tanking it. And then that culminates into these kills that fall into their hand here. These three kills. They don't get to be, they aren't able to pick up a Baron off of it because it's not up. So they don't get anything after these kills falling into their lap. They get some more time to clear waves. They get to hold on a little bit. But the item disparity is huge here. Yeah, this is a very scary situation for AM. Oh, wow. Okay, so Remy picked up an Ohm Wrecker. Oh, so boy. they can try oh, it again without the turret <laughs> being there this time. If it doesn't work, try, try again. Doesn't work, buy an Ohm Wrecker. Exactly. That's actually the best item for this team right now. Mm -hmm. They're ahead. They need to close the game out. They don't have wave clear to see to the turrets, so screw the turrets. Go past them. <laughs> A&M hanging on by the tips of their fingers like the American Ninja Warriors. They're dangling over the pit of defeat. But they're still in. Just barely. UBC. Epic Links. Looking very confident. He's setting up he a bit no of a gank though, here. Oh, no. He tries to turn it around. Does Epic Links have the damage? Bobchin can't break uh, through the whoa. armor. He does have Zonia's. He's trying to turn it now. He turns it around. Zonia's picked up. No, oh, Bobchin has got to get out of this one. But Proof is coming in from behind, looking for it. He gets the smite off. He's going to be bullied away by Forgive Me and Epic Links. He can 1v1 Bobchin. Yeah. Diana does a ton of damage, and he isn't even like close to the items that Bob Chin has. They're going to continue to Are fight trying this. To turn DJJ this? They're TP trying to turn them. this. DJJ is coming in from the backside. This could be the last fight of the game. A&M are trying to turn it around. The Shockwave finds only Heat Waves, it's a but 4v5. he is the DPS. Heat Waves is going to go down. Texas A&M are still in this game. Not a single member of them have died. They're 4v5 in front of the Baron Pit. Oh my gosh, they're still in this! They're going to go for the Baron! They're going for the Baron! I cannot right believe there. this! Bobchin is back up to full health. They turn it around, immediately peeling. They cannot afford to fight the Baron and DJJ. He comes in from the side. Chuck Norris is going down. Proof is dominating. Epic Shots is going down. Epic Links, the last chance for Texas A&M. He has to pick somebody off. He has to get these kills. He drops. It's four members dead. UBC. Are going to take the Baron. <laughs> <laughs> They're going to go for the Baron. Yeah, They're going to they go are. for more wave clear. 
to make sure that they can possibly end the game again. So they're not going to go for the turret. Yeah. It's still 35 minutes in. I think they're just enjoying themselves now. Yeah. They're, they're looking to pad those highlight reels. There's 15 seconds on a lot of members here from Texas A&M. They see it as the opportune time to pick up the Baron. Because if they overextend, they get a turret, they get an inhibitor, they get that pressure. But they want the Baron because they think it'll turn into more. Baron is worth a lot of gold yeah. in and of itself. And that'll put them towards six items from oh, multiple man. members here. Baron and Dragon 5, even better. Dragon spawns. Picarus is over there, spotted out by a ward. He's going to have to try stealing this because it could be game over if that dragon goes down. 2,000 health, 1,500. He doesn't make it over the shock wave. Line. Shock wave is huge. They try to turn it into a fight instead. Picarus has got nowhere to go. He goes down. Heat waves picks it up. Baron, dragon five, 21 kills over your opponent. Mid inhibitor, still standing. You just can't catch Bob Shin. You cannot catch that Cassidy. The cooldown on his Ripwalk is so <laughs> oh, low. Man. It just doesn't seem fair. Yeah, UBC are feeling so strong after this, but they are not closing the game out. It's like a good steak. They're savoring each and every bite, each and every kill, making sure it's worth it. However, this is giving AM time, something that was much needed after their first deficit. Yeah, but having five dragons, having Baron, absolutely huge for UBC. They can dive with the Ohm Wrecker now and be 100% fine if that's not what they go for here and they go for the throat. I'd be very surprised. Yeah, here come the Baron up minions. Epic Shots is going to try to wave clear this out. Should do just fine, but slowly but surely. They will whittle down these turrets. Epic Link's forced to deal with Bob Chin. I don't think he can 1v1 him now with that uh, Baron and five dragons. Split push comes out, rotation turns. Bob Chin gets the burn on the Epic Links. Meanwhile, the rest of UBC keep a &M on their toes by roaming turret to turret. DJJ doesn't even need minions as he is so tanky. Bob Chin still Ooh. takes damage, manages to get some big oh, Epic? crits across. Epic Links goes low. He's going to go down here. No, he's oh! still alive. He turns it around. He gets a kill, but at what cost? He's lost the top inhibitor. Epic Links is going to have to try to get back into this. Martin. And that, they're trying to go oh, for this. Oh man, forgive me, trying to go in a shockwave, pulls in three. Chuck Normus is turned upon, Depth Charge gets cleansed. Chuck Normus is doing some great damage. Epic Shots is still in. Epic Links trying to clean it up from the backside. They are going to pick up Picarus. Epic Links turns, he picks up no members. He's going to end up going That's down. It. Four members dead. They're going to end the game now. Ohm Wreckers on the Nexus turns, a quadra kill on Heat Waves. Guys, you got to take down the inhibitor. It just, there it goes. They it finally done clear just it. yet. And that's going to be UBC picking it up over Texas A&M 2-0 in the semifinals. Yeah, that was amazing from UBC after such an exciting game number one. UBC really took their time with game number two, and they played the game that they were comfortable with. They played the game that they are familiar with. Yep, camping top, camping mid, University of British Columbia advance to the finals to take on the winner. Whoever wins the next set today, dominating the West, coming over here and overcoming the teamwork of Texas A&M. Yeah, we can see some big smiles coming out from UBC as they take the first series 2-0 and rekindle the Texas A&M and University of British, British Columbia grudge match. And it's Lone Star Clash 3 all over again. The 2-0, yeah. the handshakes coming out there. DJJ, the shot caller of the team, getting them together at the end. You know, AM AM played really well. Yeah. They they held on as best they can. They played the game that they knew. They knew team fights, they knew how to sit back, wait, take advantage of any of your opponent's missteps, and it really looked like they would come back. Well, when you're down ten to one in kills, twelve minutes in the game, it's a laning phase problem that they you know they have the great late game shot calling on that team. The problem is when you get picked off, when you have that early uh, deficit, playing from behind is very difficult, especially against a team like UBC. A lot of former Challenger players in there, a lot of these guys, uh, DJJ, Proof of Payment, they've been in the Challenger series in the NACS mm -hmm. before for XDG Virtus. Yeah. So these guys are no stranger to competitive play. 
they know how to take an advantage and just continue to snowball it there and close the games out. Yeah. So UBC, they get to make it to those finals. They mm -hmm. get to represent the Western region and see if they're the West is still on top. <laughs> is the West the best? We don't know quite yet. We'll find out tomorrow at the Grand Finals. But UBC, they did get the top four in the NACC last year. And one of the things that they mentioned when they did lose in the semifinals was that they felt they didn't have enough mechanical skill. That was something that they specifically wanted this year. Just raw solo queue talent, raw ELO. And once you have all of that material, refine it into a team, refine it into proper team play. Yeah, all of the lanes looked really impressive. We saw DJJ playing Smite TP, Scion top lane, trying to duel, trying to get whatever advantage you can there. Proof of Payment's influence over the entire map was really crisp, really good. 100% kill participation for a large portion of that game. And then we saw Bob Chin just once they put some resources into him, it definitely paid off. He's like the best investment you could make. Oh, yeah. Where he's going to pay you back threefold, being able to split Ooh, push. Yeah. He did get picked off at the end there. <laughs> and that's the thing. Is Epic Lynx, if he had gotten off the ground earlier, mm -hmm. you could see the impact he would have had on that Diana. The point-and-click damage burst. He's able to deliver on it. They just weren't able to get any, any resources into him and camp the Scion because there's just so much pressure from Proof all around the map. Yeah. Well... We're going to go ahead and send it onto the stage where Devin Pyrotechnics Young is standing by with one of our winners. Devin, it's all you. Thank you very much, Seda. I am, of course, standing right next to Bob Chin from the Victorious University of British Columbia. First of all, let me say congratulations on your victory in that semifinal match. Let's get right into this, though. Did you really ex did you expect uh, Texas A&M? To put up the fight that they did, did you think maybe you'd have a little bit of an easier ride after game one just because it was going very even for a while, but then you guys just turned it on its head with your fantastic Katarina play. Did you expect it to play out there from the way it went? Uh, well, we expected uh, Texas to be a lot weaker because when we played them on the off -flight qualifiers, they, they showed a lot weaker than they are right now, but they actually put up really quality matches against us. We had uh, trouble facing them in game one. They almost took a game off us. I guess it was some of us having uh, some land issues. Some of, some of us, including myself, are playing on the big stage for the first time. But overall, I think they played really, really good. And for the Katarina play, I really didn't expect, expect it. I just went with the flow, and it just happened. I'm, I'm happy for it. Went with the flow, and you almost picked up two pentakills. Now, you almost averaged a pentakill per game, but that scumbag support of yours stole that. How, how mad were you when that happened? I was jumping, I was screaming, I hate my support. <laughs> We're not going to be friends anymore. No, I'm joking. Well, I certainly hope so. So you guys uh, not only handed Texas A&M their very first loss, you handed them their second immediately after you 2 0 into this final matchup now. Who would you like to face out of the remaining teams in this final match you'll be playing tomorrow? Obviously, I want to play against uh, UConn, but I think Army is going to come up on top with that one. Uh, and we're going to play Army in the final, and we're going to 2-0 them, or 3-0 them. Ooh, some bold predictions. Okay, all right. So now, who do you expect to come out on top in that next matchup? Just because, you know, we've been hyping up a lot of these other remaining teams. Who do you think has the edge between UConn and RMU? Probably RMU 2-0 <laughs> against UConn, because RMU has a, a scholarship program, recruited a lot of the challenger players, and they're really individually good. But we're a lot better. There we go. That's the answer I'm looking for. Okay. So after all this said and done, I mean, it's, it's been your first time here on the big stage. How uh, excited are you to be here, to see all the fans here, and to know that you know you just made a massive play, a big 2-0 on this big stage? Well, it was my first time playing uh, such a big stage. And when I got the pentakill, everyone was streaming. It was really hyphy. It was, it was amazing. I loved it. And we loved it too. That was some incredible play. Now, last question for you. Do you have any shout outs you'd like to give to your friends, family, or anyone else? Uh, shout outs to my girlfriend, my boys, my best friend, and my family for supporting me. And shout outs to UBC and Memory Express, Roll Mobility, and all the, all the other sponsors supporting our club. Thank you so much. You heard it right here, guys. Thank you very much, Bob. You can go ahead, head off, and join your team. Congratulations, and of course, best of luck in tomorrow's match. For now, though, we're going to go ahead and send it over to the analyst desk where Dash and crew are going to break that series down.
Thank you, Pyra and Bob Chin, for the interview there. Breaking this series down, a, a very solid win there to make a 2-0 series by UBC. Much more dominating than the first one, and I, I kind of want to attack as to why that is. I think it all started in their champion select. We questioned whether or not their champion select was going to be any good, and they made one very pivotal change, which was that Cassidy pickup. Yeah, I, I want to start with uh, Texas A&M because I think that their pick ban was actually very good, right? So both teams did the exact same ban strategy, right? But when it came to picking, uh, they swapped it up with two key additions, right? First off, this time Gragas went into the jungle, and then they picked up Alistar for the bot lane. Uh, so you have Graves, Alistar, right? Different bot lane. Um, Graves is Chuck Normans' favorite character, right? So you're thinking, okay, maybe we're not going to have a little bit of the scuffle that we had in the beginning of that game, right? There's better peel overall. But then as well, having Gragas in the jungle this time is if they wanted to run it back with a Katarina, now you have ways to stop. You have way more ways to stop Katarina than you did with the Nunu, right? So they, expecting the Katarina and feeling pretty confident from their game one, made, I think, a pretty good adaptation. But uh, UBC still kind of surprised them with their final pick. And of course, that Kastin pick was just so important. In game one, you saw Katarina zoned out in those early to mid fights by Epic Links on that Diana pick. He picks it up again, we go with the Kastin, and it's a different story. Now Bob Chin has so much more mobility, so much more yeah. flexibility to both leave and re-engage in these team fights. Riftwalk, just so much more important, and you saw how well that paid off for him with that just absurd scoreline at the end of the game. Well, and that's the key there. They're playing champions select correctly in a best of series. So often we talk about uh, the approach for the winning team being don't change anything unless they force you to change it. Right? Right. You already pulled out a victory with that composition that you had. Show them the same thing until they force you to change it. So as you mentioned, bands, the same. Yeah. Picks, relatively the same. When you look at, okay, Gragas was the first pick both times. Even the Graves Diana, Graves Lucian, essentially interchangeable. Very so similar. they're still yes. not showing a change in strategy. Then, so they respond with Nautilus Rexai, Urgot Scion. Same, same, same picks in order, thing. basically. They're saying, all right, we'll win again with that composition if you let us have it. That's when Texas A&M comes in with their, with their curveball. Yeah, right? the Orianna, Alistair. Alistair. Now we know the Gronkus is going in the jungle. Alistair in support. They have way more peel. As you mentioned, a, a ton more ways to stop the Katarina. Oh, so very smartly, okay, we won't play Katarina now. Yeah, and I had a little bit uh, of a concern because we were kind of poking holes in UBC's comp last time, right? And like, why was this game so close? Why did it work out that way? Well, it's still the Bob Chin show, and there's still not a lot of wave clear, right? When it came to closing out this game, the scoreline was as bloody as it was because they didn't have a team that could end it as quickly, right? But that's not their style, right? They picked, the Cassidy was an even better pick than Cat was for the way they want to play the game. And then once we got into game, you know, it was the comp adaptations for a and but it was the play adaptations for UBC. Proof of Payment was, I think, the all-star of this series, right? The repeated ganks onto mid lane, where last time it was in the bot lane, right? He was keeping them guessing where he was going to move, and it ended up getting them into a really, really big advantage by the first team fight. And we were really stunned that Orianna pick came through once again for epic shots. We thought there was no way he was going to get it. That was a huge champion for him in the last game, and one of the few reasons that Texas A&M was able to keep up so well despite falling behind early. And in this game, they just adapted in-game. They didn't change their pick ban strategy, but early game, they force all the flash out, they immediately get the follow-up gank, and instantly, now that epic shots is behind, their team fight damage and their team fight yeah. threat is just absolutely down. That being said, the early game for A&M actually went significantly better yeah. uh, up to that 10-minute mark, right? Yeah. Whereas we saw the two early kills in the bot lane last time, there was only the one kill in the mid lane on the Orianna with a lot of focus, right? So you're pulling a lot of focus mid. That's fine. You gave up the kill without the flash. Okay, we can survive from that. We can come back from that. Right. Where things really started to fall apart this time, though, was that first dragon fight. And pulling that up right now... Oh, oh. actually, never mind. We're going to go Completely with the... Completely different uh, play. No, all good. That was a very good game. <laughs> Proof. Yes. That is well, that's what we still talked about a very earlier. good game. Well, yeah. To your point, then, about right. him being the player of the series, fantastic adjustment in play, realizing that last game, the Orianna was the big issue. Right. This game, let's just make sure that she's not. It also speaks a little bit to Proof's style, right? Uh, Game one, there was a giant fight in the bot lane. Summoner's blown, they ended up getting a kill. So what does Proof do? Goes right back to that lane, right? The same way, they get both the heal and the flash off, and he's like, all right, well, I'm gonna come back right there. So he kind of smells the blood in the water when he's playing this champion Rek'Sai, and he will make repeated ganks until it works. 
And also at the same time, good not to go back to that bot lane in game two. Much easier to, to gank that Gragas and that Lucian, especially when they kind of overextended in the early game. Right. This game two, Alistair. Like, you're yeah. not getting into an Alistair. It's just not going to happen. Graves as well does a lot of damage, has those extra resistances from True Grit. So just overall, a much harder, or much harder lane to gank. All right, now I want to jump into that early game team fight around the Dragon. This ended up being a four for one in favor of... Uh, British Columbia. They ended up picking a fifth kill up on the back side of this. Right. But around the Dragon Bite, I actually do feel like it was a fight AM had the right to take. Yeah. I do think that it was winnable in a sense. I feel like their approach to it, though, was incorrect. They quickly split the team uh, and allowed proof to get to uh, the back line on the Graves. Yeah. And once the Graves was gone, the sustained damage disappears. And uh, Diana hadn't made her way all the way down yet to help with kind of that assassination potential. Sure. Yeah. Do we do, do we, we want to run up there? Do we want to? Well, it might come up if it comes oh. up. Well, if, if it comes up, still talk I mean, about it. Well, so as you say, right? It was a good decision uh, on their parts to say, you know, we our comp is so strong, we're so powerful, right? But the preparation was not there. The vision was not necessarily perfectly in place, right? Oriana very low on mana had enough to send one command protect over to Graves. Uh, and then Graves ended up dying. Uh, Picker is actually a, a rare misplay, sending the Rek'Sai into his own AD carry. You know, fantastic play in the first game. Didn't really translate to this fight uh, particularly. And so when the combination of lack of vision, lack of preparation when it comes to mana, and kind of the misposition of abilities, it ended up going a UBC's way and started a bigger snowball than their uh, kind of 1K being down in the first game went. Yeah, I feel like it was a little bit of AM getting antsy, right? We saw in the first game, they were, only, they were down 1.5k gold at most in the early game, and they were very comfortable in that position. They were okay with saying, that's fine, you can have your slight gold lead, we'll rotate, we'll take right. turrets, we'll extend this game. They chose this team fight, played it improperly, and all of a sudden the deficit was 2.5k, and that was too much for them. They, right. felt, they felt compelled to have to make plays and make moves, and in attempting to get back into the game, they fell even farther behind. And well, this is really rare misstep from them. As we talked about that fight before, Graves wasn't even level six, unfortunately, didn't have that collateral damage. And it felt like the team fight they wanted was the level six team fight. That's yeah. when they're strong. That's when they have their ultimates available. But Graves without collateral damage, we watch Picarus use the explosive cask, knock that Rek'Sai into the Graves. And uh, you know, when he doesn't have the damage from yeah. collateral damage, it's just not enough for him to come out on top. And yeah, then of course, uh, oh, no, go ahead. A, a quick thing to mention though for a and uh, they were able to get a tower off of that, right? Like, very much to their style, where they want to keep the map in mind. They went, they got a tower, Epic Links was taken out from that one, but even as this whole game collapsed around them, they were still looking for picks. They were still looking for fights. They were still looking to shove towers. They were playing their game up into the moment five dragon team came into their base and took them out, right? And that's something I really want to commend them for. You see a lot, teams even in the LCS, right, when they get behind, just kind of wait at the base, wait for the end to come. And they actually turned two fights yeah. in the end stage of the game when a lot of us had started to kind of write them off and, and really pull some stuff out because of their dedication to their strategy. Absolutely. And so what I want to look at next is what we can take away from this series on the side of uh, UBC uh, in terms of holes in their play style. Yeah. Right? One of these two teams in the next series we're about to see is going to go up against them in the finals. How are they going to beat this mechanically dominant team? As we saw, they come out of lane, you know, fast. Yeah. They come that they ten minutes in, they're like, nope, landing phase is over. We yeah. have our gold lead. We're gonna start diving turrets. Yeah, we're team fighting at nine minutes. And just fight you all the time. Yeah. Right? So what do we do, what do I do as Yukon or RMU against that, knowing that we're probably coming out behind in the lane phase? I don't think you can give proof of payment Rexai. I don't think you can give him any champion where he's going to have an early game impact. It's just not going to work for you. We saw he adapted in both games. Game one, amazing pressure on the bottom side, got them a small lead. And while it didn't transition, transition well, they still got that 1K gold lead pretty much solely on his own individual play. Game two, they absolutely shut down epic shots in the mid lane. And so for any team trying to face them down, you just have to ban out proof of payment. And that's going to be tough because it means you're not going to be able to ban away one of Bob Quinn's champs or one of DJJ's champs. Yeah. yeah. Bob, Bob Chin also, right? Like it's Bob Chin proof of payment are your top two, right? Bob Chin gets a pentakill and a half in the first game, right? Has an amazing game on Cassidy. And 
even if he was not playing up to the level that he did in this series, the champions that they pick for him and the compositions that they build mean that even if he's not doing very well, the follow-up is going to be there. The damage is going to be enormous. So unless you can craft a composition that can kind of defocus or devalue their mid lane aggression, you're not going to be able to come out ahead, right? DJJ in the top lane, just kind of being a rock, right? Remy, they're both doing their jobs and they're both doing it very well, yep. right? They showed up in this series, but they were not the standouts that Proof of Payment and Bob Chin were. Now, the only other uh, point of attack that I can come up with being that uh, Bob Chin has a decently deep champion pool. We saw him get targeted with LeBlanc Zed. They banned out the Ari themselves. He played Katarina Cassidy. All right, that's five champions right there. So you already know you're not entirely banning him out. You can't right. pigeonhole, pigeonhole him onto a champion that you want him to play. But the other point of attack that I see is keeping them off of this full tank composition that allows him to do what he wants in team fights. Right. We talked about earlier or, and illustrated through replays, like you have this massive front line with three giant tanks that no one can get through, then he can just dance around as Katarina until you're low enough that he comes in and pentakills you. Don't afford them that opportunity to protect their carries so well. Maybe instead of banning out his carry champions, you say you can have whatever carry champion right. you want because you're going to get one. Let's remove the support system around that carry champion. And for that reason, I would really like to see the next team to face them pick red side. I would like to see them use those two picks well. If you have to sacrifice uh, a jungler to proof of payment, if you give him Rek'Sai, he's going to first pick it. And if he does, you can take that Nautilus away from your, for yourself. You can take Urgot if you want to. You can dismantle the team comp that they built here today. Yeah. I, I, personally, I think Urgot is also a really big part of this composition. You know, I've been calling it a one-threat comp because the tanky, big <laughs> sources of damage, right? I mean... Certainly, once, once that one source is ahead, everyone starts to kind of crunch them down. If Heat Waves is on something killable, right? Like, we saw there was a pick made in the mid lane this game where they blew everything and he didn't even go down. If Heat Waves is on a character that you can catch out and they're able to take that person out first, you start chipping away at the support structure, zoning Bob Chin and actually being able to kill one of these other members might mean that you can just overwhelm them through raw numbers. Yeah, the Urgot damage can't be ignored. There are definitely yeah. more than just two players on yeah. the side of uh, UBC. For sure. Well, anyway, one of our next two teams has to win in this following series before they get the opportunity to go up against British Columbia. So we'll see that RMU and UConn in just a few minutes. We're going to take a quick break. It's just one of the strengths and weaknesses of the comp, and it is going to be pretty much the same here, except that's going to be a jungle Gragas for Picarus now. He's going to have more pressure in these lanes as opposed to the Nunu where he was running around, yeah. had a little bit of pressure, but keeping up with the lane phase of UBC was definitely something that Picarus is now going to try to give himself an edge on. Yeah, a lot more CC on this team. So if it is a Katarina locked in once again, should be a bit better for AM to deal with. All right. Bobchin locks in the Cassidy. I like that. Yeah, so I was actually talking with the backstage and their coach, Heaven Time, he was like, I don't know why you picked Katarina. I told him not to pick Katarina. I thought Kastner would be the better champion here. And I guess he's listening to his coach this time. He had his fun. He had his pentakills, mm -hmm. almost two of them. But <laughs> now he's on the Kastner. He's on another mobile champion, another champion that doesn't have to weave too much in and out of fights, just keeps going with the fight. So he's a little bit more durable than the Katarina. He'll be able to get into that back line and stay in that back line and then continue to push forward with his team. So. They do suffer from almost the same problem, but they're still going to play around their wave player. They're still going to be okay with that. And Texas A&M, they get a little more dive. They get a little more team fight themselves with the Alistar combined with the Gragas. It, it seems as though Epic Lynx is kind of in an awkward situation now. Last game, he had a squishy Katarina that he could target and destroy in team fights. But this time around, he's got to hunt down a Cassidy who has as many jumps, if not more than Diana, but we are loading into the game. We're about to get into game number two between Texas's A&M University and the University of British Columbia. So far, UBC are up one to zero. One more win would put them in the grand finals of the 2015 NACC. And the shot at that huge amount of prize money, huge oh, yeah. amount of scholarships there for themselves, and a lot of validation for the League of Legends habit in, or lifestyle in college. Mm. That's a big thing here for both these teams. You heard UBC talking about how it's an identity for them, that they are the League of Legends guys at their school. And last game, Camp him so much this game, they blew two flashes for that too, knowing his was down. Really, really big commitment to taking him out early. Yeah, but 
that is going to be Bobchin getting an assist right away. He's up in CS, and Epic Shots is forced to start with a double door answer. That's going to slow down his build a lot. Ooh, yeah. The fact that he's not on path for that, Athene's early on, is going to deter it a tiny bit. He also gets boots for himself as well. So definitely going about a bit out of the way to just survive the lane. Yeah, this is starting to look like UBC are playing a style that they have typically played throughout the rest of the NACC during group stages and qualifiers. If it worked for them then, why not get it working now? However, playing that style, that is something that Tamu is familiar with, has been doing research on and preparing for. And UBC just trying to play their style. Like I said, they haven't researched too much, but if they're able to dictate the pace of the game, then it's definitely in their favor. And camping for Bobchin, Kastner has a little more gank assistance than Ekaterina. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, they're both just as snowbally. The big concern for Texas A&M is making it out of the laning phase without being at too much of a deficit. So far, it seems like things are pretty much even outside of that Bob Chin assist. And take a look at the wards from Picarus. He's getting deep wards all around that mid. He's got a pink on the bottom side river. Epic shots with no flash feels so safe because he's because he knows he's got Picarus. Now, Epic Lynx could be caught out here. DJJ does have level he's got six. level six, too. Turns it around. Epic Lynx is going to have to... Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. So Proof is playing to his solo lanes, but he's yeah. taking both kills, too. <laughs> so this is a very familiar UBC style, though. Camp top. Remy going for the auto attack grass again. Oh, they turn around. Ooh, Chuck Normus, man. Already taking big harass. Some great wave clear. And forgive me, he's actually hanging on. No, there he goes. Finally drops the Targon charge. Proof starting on the red side. Gragas starting on his blue. Everyone's on the same side of the jungle. Similar, similar setup to game number one. Except for the part where they didn't do a grump bottom. Yes. And the level two actually comes out for Texas A&M a little earlier. Remy's going to look for the hook. Oh, good dodge. <laughs> Get out of here. Smacks him on the way out, says, I don't want any of this. Proof. He, he actually is on route to go for a gank on the bottom side of the map. Clearing yeah. this blue buff puts him down there. And it's good to see UBC come out with more diverse strategies because it used to just be camp top, camp middle, and it was very predictable. And now if they're able to play to this bottom lane, which has the same two champions again, the Nautilus and the Ergot, they play to this bottom lane. It's very unexpected. But of course, they saw it last game, so it could be a little bit unexpected. Yeah. Could get something changing up a little bit. Proof clearing out the Scuttle Crab. Oh, he's confident on this Rek'Sai. Oh, side. yeah, he's... Going around, gets a deep ward. He is going to find an overextended Epic Shots who's shoving forward. Bob Jin shows that the gank is coming. Is he going to find the knockup? Epic Shots caught in the slow. Oh, he burns his flash, gets out just fine. Takes a lot of damage, too. Oh, That's yeah. going to be a potion toll on him in that lane. The sooner you get those potions, the sooner you get him out of lane. And giving any type of help to a Cassidy helps him through that early game, helps him get to that mid late game where Bob Jin is going to be an absolute beast on that champion. Winning phase continues. Uh-oh. Flank coming in from behind. Proof of payments. Looking for it. He comes over the wall. Epic Whoa. Shots has no flash. He gets the flash knockup. Epic Shots could give up first blood. He does. Proof of payment secures it. They are just trying to keep down Epic Shots. He had such an amazing performance on this Oriana. Bans <laughs> in game number two. So I said you would, you would think they would change, <laughs> but yeah. they didn't. And immediately going for identical picks once again. The Gragas insta lock from AM. Proof hovering the Rek'Sai and the Nautilus. <laughs> uh, did, did we go through like a time loop or something? This is the exact same thing. Yeah, they're, they're like remake, remake? Yeah. Remake? Yeah, all right. We'll do it remake. again. Remake, you guys. 20 minute, no rush. Man, if we're seeing the exact same game over again, I'm not going to complain. Yeah, that, that was, was fun. Uh, oh, man, it was great. It was great. You know, AM. I wonder if they feel that they can play out the exact same comp. It worked really effectively, and it was really only until Bob Chin started going off. But he still gets the counter pick, right? Yes. He still gets the Katarina. They didn't ban it. They didn't drop it away for the Zed. They're going to change it up a tiny bit. Go with the Graves instead of the Lucian here. So Lucian and his impact in the later game wasn't as powerful in team fights. They want to have more layered ultimates. Graves on top of an Orianna if they pick it again. 
absolute huge amount of burst damage there. Also, they pick up the Diana before they see what the top lane is, but that could be a mid lane Diana. That could be Epic Shots playing the Assassin that he's wanted to play for a while now, shying away from the Orion. If he gets a squishy matchup in the mid lane, they might swap it. Yeah, so far it seems as though UBC are playing the exact same game, leaving Bob Chin up for last pick. Trying to find out if Epic Shots is going to end up on that mid or uh, Oriana or Diana or switch it up for something new. Yeah, UBC was not happy with their performance in that last game, but they definitely don't chalk it up to picks and bans. They're going to go once again with the low wave clear composition here. If they draft a mid laner with substantial wave clear, it'll definitely cover that weakness. But so far, they were exploited earlier on that. But here's the thing. It's wave clear is not like, oh, it's the, it's the end all be all of team comps. You can play around it for sure. You start team fights, they have the ability to do so. They played to that strength. The only thing is you do give up sieging power. But it's just like how a sieging team is like, oh, we don't want to take team fights, right? So this is a big amount of validation for them. If they make the finals, you know everybody at the school's gonna be watching them. Yeah. This is very exciting. So Texas, we now load onto the rift. Yeah, and Texas A&M, pretty much the same thing there too. Big sports school. Mm -hmm. Get esports in the mix. They do have that legacy. A lot of support there mm -hmm. for competition. And they want to be able to set that up. They said a lot of them are seniors. Oh, oh. BM going down in the mid lane. <laughs> I'm not sure who fired the first shot, but the taunts are coming out. You know, Bob Chin is actually the designated trash talker for UBC. If he gets the ability to trash talk even more this game, it's gonna make him a happy, happy boy being. A little bit of a deep ward coming out. Looks like AM are content to sit with that defensive line. UBC not going to opt into any sort of silly lane swaps. I say silly, they're actually rather clever. They're very fun. But UBC are content in their mechanical skill. I mean, heck, they picked up first blood three minutes in. Yeah, and they were up 3-1. It was just the team fights that they were struggling in a bit until Bob Chin showed up and just crushed off of some mistakes from Texas A&M. Uh, Texas A&M, what, what I was just talking about a second ago, though, is the support. A lot of them are seniors, right? They're going to graduate, but winning this is going to give them a lot of validation for their club, a lot of validation for their, the legacy that it would leave as well. And more people would be attracted to the club and would basically take up the banner when they're gone. That's what these guys are here for. You heard that they weren't too much in it for the money at first, and now it's about that legacy for them. Yeah. Legacy is very important. Coming into game number two, minion spawn. Both of the bot lanes start off in lane. They don't want to get caught out by that quick level two once again. You see Chuck Normus is shoving that wave as hard as possible. Try to keep it balanced out. 